they're improving in a lot of different ways that are not necessarily visible. And over the next six to 18 months, I think what we're going to start seeing is lots of these next generation things, including Vega, connect together and become part of like the next wave that takes crypto closer to mainstream adoption and real world utility. Hey everyone, wherever you are, I hope you're having a wonderful week so far. We're here with the latest episode of the Inside Crypto Show, interviews and discussion with regular people just like yourselves. Today we are joined by Barney Mannerings, the co-founder of Vega, the derivatives layer for Web3, backed by Coinbase, Pantera, and other prominent VCs. Before we dive into derivatives, let's welcome Barney to the show. Barney, thank you so much for making time. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Hi, Crab. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to tell you a little bit about me. I'm a computer scientist by trade, and I spent the first sort of 10, 15 years of my career working in, I guess, what we'd call now TradFi. I worked in consulting around capital markets, so building trading systems, building risk systems for sort of a large, good number of like top tier investment banks. I also spent two and a half years building sort of core matching engine systems and stuff at the London Stock Exchange. I spent a lot of time with traders and a lot of time building trading systems and technology and very passionate about both creating fair markets and creating good markets and creating these kind of things in a way that is innovative and open. And I think one of the things I noticed as a computer scientist was very much on board with the dot-com boom and following all of that stuff that happened with the internet and mobile. And it was always a little saddening to me to watch finance get left behind. And when Bitcoin came along and started to create this alternative model that didn't require gatekeepers and move so slowly, it was really quite exciting. Got involved in a little bit of Bitcoin early on, got involved in Ethereum reasonably early on and started looking at that. And as things moved on, I got more and more into actually this technology could disrupt the industry I'm in and could be something that solves this kind of innovation problem, solves this openness problem, accessibility problem of finance and changes from this kind of gatekeepered old world, 19th century model, 18th century model, whatever, to 21st century open, accessible to all. That was got, what got me excited and ultimately caused me to end up starting Vega with Ramsey. Nice. I mean, no one like switches on that altruism switch, right? So during your career, when was that point you started feeling, okay, I'm part of the system is not accessible. I want to change it. Do you recall the memory it, or the situation? It just builds up over time. The first thing is when you're part of that, you see all these products and things that traders and who are professional traders can do. And you're like, maybe I want to go at that. Maybe can I participate in this market? And in the UK, you have things like spread betting, which allows you to access markets, but it's gatekeepered. And there's a, you take the streaming quotes from the provider. You don't actually have access to the true underlying market. And so that's a little frustrating when you're like, in that world and you want to do it. Because if you're a carpenter and you actually want to do some carpentry on your own house, you can do that. You can buy the tools and you can do that. But if you're in finance, you don't get the same access to the things that you work on. So that was one sort of data point, I guess, one thing that just kept coming up. And then the other thing is just that you start to notice all the time these little things where like they've built this super efficient system. Obviously, there's lots about banks as inefficient, actually. They lose money all right, left, and center of doing crazy inefficient things. But you look at a trading desk and a trading system they've built, they've got a super efficient system. They're paying like half a basis point here and everything's like super optimized. And then they're like, oh yeah, we're just going to whack 50 basis point spread on this corporate client who presents no risk to us because they don't know anything about this market. So they're just going to pay it and then they can't go anywhere else. Yeah, screw them type thing. So <laughs> you just keep seeing that happen again and again, where it's like, the competitive market that should drive down the fees and spreads for everyone and should mean that a, a company that wants to hedge a risk, for instance, which is the reason a lot of derivatives exist and actually solving a business problem, is paying over the odds because they don't really have a choice. Their commercial bank is here. This is their relationship. This is what they have to do. And so you just start to realize that these things would not be like this if they were another industry where anyone could compete. If they were on the internet or if they were like buying groceries from supermarkets, there'd be a huge competition for price and users and things would become incredibly efficient. And in some parts of finance, they are. But when you get to the little guys and when you get to certain corners of it, it's very gatekeepered and there's far too much profit extraction because there's just not enough competition, not enough innovation. Systems are slow and old. So all those things add up and you see what happened to everything prior to the internet and you just go, hey, the, the internet is going to do this to money and finance eventually. And I think crypto is how. Wow. And that's a perfect way to end that question. Barney, before the podcast, I told you, hey, I'm going to speak to Barney Mannerings from Vega. And a lot of people went to the site and they loaded it up and like, they see that very bold statements, the world's most advanced DEX. And everyone is familiar with the DEX right now, like even regular people like me, you know, Uniswap, QuickSwap on Polygon, right? 
why is that statement so true? I guess is people look at them like, yes, this looks complicated. This looks complex and people don't mean it in a bad way, right? There's a lot of functionality built in, but why is that true? Yeah, sure. And I think to address complexity, I think all reasonably useful and generally applicable technical systems tend to be complicated on the inside. You look at a car, horribly complicated, but you end up with two pedals to push, wheel to turn, and it's all good. And the same with DEXs, even very simple DEXs like Uniswap, which have some very good properties, but also other issues like the fees on Ethereum being as high as they are, or impermanent loss, as they call it. If you look at the actual system that supports Uniswap and Ethereum and staking and everything, horrendous complexity underneath there. So everything is complex and the difference is Vegas quite young and we're slowly getting to the UX and addressing the complexity by adding layers of abstraction on top that will make it simple. So being advanced doesn't mean it has to be complex. It's just where we are right now that bits of it are more complex and you know, that will change quite rapidly over the next two to three months. In terms of why is it the most advanced decks, I think the starting point is that the entire system is designed with that in mind. So you know, Ethereum was designed to be a blockchain like Bitcoin that could run code. And one of the problems they had to solve through that was like, how are we going to decide how much to charge people to run the code so that they can't like take over a block? And so you're basically bidding for block space. That doesn't make a huge amount of sense in finance. Like actually the same problem exists in an exchange, right? In an exchange, you still have a certain amount of capacity for transactions, but actually you just charge people a fee for the transaction and use that to decide how things happen. And so the problem with the Ethereum model is it's very difficult to predict what the fees will be, and they're often very high compared to the size of your trade, which makes it an inefficient venue. That's just one example. There are lots of other problems. There's things like MEV. There's things like how long is the block time? What is the throughput? How many transactions can you do? Do you have limit orders? So can you set price? Can you have a stop loss order? All of those different things, and they all don't really exist on a lot of the kind of Ethereum-based DEXs. So the reason we say the world's most advanced DEX is because actually it's a full stack system that's designed to be a decentralized exchange. And it's not only designed to be a decentralized exchange, but really simple stuff like spot swaps, atomic swaps. It's also designed to be a DEX for derivatives and more complex financial products. Not only can you do things like a Uniswap style spot market, which will be coming very soon, I think, on the Vega network, you can do things like take a leverage position or in future even create more complex products like options. And that's because the architecture of the underlying network understands concepts like risk management, understands concepts like margin and liquidations, understands order books, understands settlement. Uh, all of those things are built into the system. It really is a sort of full stack DEX, if you like, where the whole system is designed to power a DEX. And it, the other part of that being the most advanced DEX is that I have a history of working on trading systems and with real traders, if you like. And when I say real traders, traders who are trading in real world assets, often for reasons beyond just speculation, for hedging, for corporate reasons, or they're running a serious regulated fund. And one of the questions that I know the answer to is like, let's say the market existed and there was enough liquidity. If I wanted to convince one of those traders to come and trade on a blockchain based system, like what would have to be true? What would have to be true about fees? What would have to be true about capital efficiency? What would have to be true about risk? What would have to be true about latency? And so I know roughly speaking, the answer to those questions. And so when we sat down to design Vega, we have had in mind that kind of checklist of, is this going to be something that either from day one or has a very clear path to being something which ticks all those boxes so that one day we can actually say, hey, this, these, this bank that's screwing you over, there's now an alternative, you can use this instead. And I think Vega is probably the first sort of DEX solution that is built on that basis and that kind of is demonstrating that we can get there. And that doesn't mean that others won't iterate and get there at, at all. But I think from what I've seen, we're the first sort of one to have started from that point of view. That's where we need to get to and to build that into the design decisions. That's a really good point as well, Barney, because I know like we started a trading desk at 21 Co just last year. And one of our traders, the guy who started it is a former trader from HSBC. And I know he's talked to me about trading and is that sort of like the end goal, uh, maybe perhaps not the end goal, but is that something in the future where you see traders from like various institutions doesn't have to be like something big like HSBC saying, hey, Vega is interesting. There are efficiencies there that we just can't do on our existing system. I should reach out to Vega and see about trading on Vega. Yeah. And, and look, it might not be like an HSBC. It might not be a big bank. It might be like a small fund or some corporate interests who want to do some hedging. But one of the things I think is true, like if we look at crypto and we're building this great toolkit of stuff. We've got these kind of financial primitives. We've got ERC-20s and the ability to issue assets. We've got stable coins. And that's like the basis for sort of a parallel economy, if you like, a parallel financial system. But right now, what we're using it for is either is pretty much all internal to crypto. 
and it's mostly related to speculating on the price of those things. Like the only bit of the crypto financial system that even does things really like fund new projects is basically VCs. Whereas in the traditional world, you can get products and you can use financial products like mortgages to fund building and buying houses. You can fund infrastructure projects. You can fund starting businesses. You can fund joint ventures and you can move that debt around and you can have derivatives on that debt and you can lock in fixed rates. And that's just on the debt side of things. Every financial product has all these use cases. You're hedging the cost of resources. You're hedging fluctuations in the economy to try and manage businesses. And what I would love to see, because I think for us to achieve this kind of dream of an actual decentralized financial system, it needs to happen, is these real world use cases where people are getting business value or personal value out of using these decentralized financial products beyond just using them as a kind of speculation tool or maybe a sort of decentralized version of a savings account. But even those, do we have anything with that small amount of risk? Maybe something like compound treasury is the first foray into that. Really, at the moment, there's one rough use case. And so getting out of that and getting into this kind of like actual real world use cases so that people can actually start saying, here's a reason why you should onboard to crypto. You should onboard to crypto because you're currently paying this to do this hedge. Or you're currently paying this to get this product from a bank and you could get it for half the fees or a better spread or whatever if you did it on chain. Like that's the dream, that's the goal. That's what we are trying to build Vega towards. And that's an admirable goal as well. Like we had a guest on a few weeks ago and she's doing fixed income products on chain in Singapore. And she was saying like just the cost efficiencies alone are just things that they can do as an on-chain organization that a bank would only dream of just because it's just far more efficient to do it on-chain. Yeah, totally. And especially for niche products, like if you have the world's most liquid equity market, then sure, it's pretty, pretty cheap to trade there because you share the cost of those servers and all those bankers are among millions of traders. But if you've got something much more niche, something with a smaller number of traders, it becomes prohibitively expensive to create those markets in the current system, whereas on-chain, anyone can come and do that and it's nearly free. Yeah, huge advantage. You recently launched an alpha mainnet, and I just wanted to check in for Vega listeners who are probably going to be listening to this or watching this on YouTube, right? Like, how's it going? How do you feel about it? Are you happy with the progress? What's your general consensus? In your mind? I mean, I'm going to say it's going super well. And the reason I'm going to say that is because it hasn't fallen over. Seriously, like you're launching a new distributed system. Distributed systems are hard in the process during testing and you incentivize testnet. We had plenty of instances where we're incentivizing the community to trade and things stopped and working through all those bugs and fixing them and trying to get that done in a way where we put something out there that works. And so to have seen the code that the team's written get picked up by these independent validators, we're not running a DevOps team, we're not helping them install it or run it. So they have to do everything by looking at the docs and asking us questions on Discord or whatever. And you see that all happen. That's gone live. The community has voted in and said, hey, we're going to create trading. And then some people have come along and literally you know, voted in and launched markets. And again, all independent people who have decided to do this Obviously, we provide tech support if they ask how something works, but basically all these complete independent people doing all of this have come together to vote in markets, create markets, provide liquidity, and they're now trading. And just the fact that's happened, it hasn't fallen over and no one has really lost any money in terms of the system being hacked or allocating the money the wrong way or something. It's all worked correctly as far as we know so far and fingers crossed that'll continue. So to me, that's unbelievably good and everything I could have hoped for in like month one, so to speak. I think the volume that's been going on has suggested people are getting interested in picking up on it. I think it started off a few hundred K a day and something like three to $4 million of Notional a day nice. happening now. And that's not huge, but also when you look at some of the things, other protocols and decks that have been live, try and do similar stuff to us like Injective, we're closing in on those relatively quickly. And I think we've got lots going on in the roadmap coming up. So yeah, I'm very happy with how it's gone so far. Like it really encourage people to give it a try and to give us feedback because really the whole plan right now is just to iterate based on feedback to make the software as useful for as many people as possible as quickly as possible. That's great. This sort of feeds into my next question, Barney, of I've been in crypto since 2018 and I had a friend, I used to live in Ireland many years ago, and he was like, oh, Korean, I saw you're in crypto. Cool. Stay away from derivatives and stop lost and options and that sort of stuff because that's how I lost five figures of euros, that sort of thing. And I've stayed away, but I've also been interested and I wanted to try leverage and think like anybody who's in crypto, right? But I've always been deterred by the complexity. And I was wondering if with Vega or in general, have these systems improved to where regular people who are in crypto, who might be a little bit nervous or recalcitrant can say, okay, I'm going to try this with Vega and this will be like accessible to me. Yeah, I think, look, there's two sides to this coin. There is on the one side, 
Yes, and it's happening more and more. UX is improving. The tools that you have for managing risk and the way things are explained to you is improving. On the other side, complexity isn't the thing that's dangerous, it's risk. And I give an example. If you have a ski resort and you have a green run that's extremely not steep and it wiggles around and is a very complicated shape, and then you have a double black diamond run that is like super steep, but it's straight. Now, the green one's more complex. It's more complex. You might not even be able to see the end. You don't know where it goes, but it's got a nice green sign, and you're going to slowly wind down there and have a lovely day. The double black diamond run, like you try and do that, doesn't matter that it's really simple. <laughs> it's just a big straight line. If you try and go down there without the right skills, you're going to fall all the way down. True. And leverage is like that. It's like the steepness of the run. It's, if you take zero leverage, then you can lose a bunch of money, but you don't lose it all that quickly. If you take zero leverage and buy some Bitcoin and it halves in value, you lose half your money. If you take two times leverage and buy some Bitcoin and halves its value, you lose all of your money. If you take 10 times leverage and you buy Bitcoin and you make, it loses 10% of its value, you lose all the money. And if you take 100x leverage, which some people offer and it loses 1%, you lose all your money. So like you imagine you're on some exchange and you select that slider to 100% and then like just at one point during that day, it just has to once during the day go 1% below, even if it recovers. At the point it goes 1% below, you get liquidated and you're out. Like. <laughs> That is dangerous. It's very simple to understand why, because you took 100x leverage, and if it moves 1%, you're dead. But a lot of the centralized exchanges don't have an incentive to tell you that. Ah, you take leverage, and if it goes up by, if it doubles in price, you'll make thousands of dollars. Great, but it's never going to happen, because at some point, you're always going to lose 1% somewhere on the line. Not always, but a huge percentage of the time, because, because price is moving a kind of random walk. Even if you think it's going up, and even if you're right, if you take a lot of leverage, before you get proven right and make all the money, one of the little down steps will kill you. And so there's the sort of danger of leverage. And I think one thing is just like, if you try leverage, try not much leverage and try for short trade horizons. If you say, I don't know, I think ETH is going to go up today and you take 2x leverage, you're probably going to be okay because it's probably not going to lose 50% today. So you might lose a bunch more money than you wanted to, but you're probably not going to get wiped out. Whereas if you took 50x leverage, you might get wiped out. I think and this is not advice and trading advice or financial advice. Don't trade anything. Don't take any leverage. Say it, stay at home, wrap yourself in a blanket. So there's that risk side. And the thing that we can do is firstly make the things more accessible, the wallets, the UX is easier, but also expose some of that information. This market is this volatile. If you take this much leverage, on average, you would be closed out within one hour, two hours, whatever. So we're working on things like that to say, how do we make the risk side more easy to understand? Because I think one of the things about crypto is everyone can do it. It's a blockchain. We can't stop you. It doesn't mean you should if you don't have the skills. Everyone can go to a, climb up a hill and try and ski down the steepest part. Also not recommended if you don't have the skills. What we will try and do, we do try and place warnings everywhere about the risks of doing this stuff for the uninitiated. And we certainly are looking for ways to improve how we demonstrate to people the risk they're taking and how we help them to manage that. I think that's a great step and good enough. I think a lot of places, I started off my crypto journey on Binance and I remember looking at leverage. I'm like, I don't think there was any warnings then. I still don't think a few years later, five years later, there's no warnings there. Yeah, I think the other thing about derivatives actually is maybe you don't use them because you want leverage. Maybe you use them for another reason, which is that maybe they get you access to something you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So maybe there's a token that like has only ever been sold to VCs and is locked up now, but you could buy futures in that token because you would like to go long or short that you want to express an opinion. You don't have to do that with leverage. You can do that at 1x leverage, but you can do that when you couldn't actually buy the token or you want to actually trade based on the amount of rainfall or the average price of all of the stocks without actually buying those stocks. Derivatives can give you those kind of products. They can give you synthetics. They can give you different types of payoffs. They can give you betting star payoffs. So derivatives can do a lot more than spot assets. So one of the reasons to trade them if you're a trader and want to do things is because you're trying to get access to leverage. But the other reason is if you're trying to trade something that there isn't like a way to acquire that asset or a spot asset you can acquire, maybe there's a derivative that does that. And again, not telling you should go and trade derivatives, but I'm saying if there's a thing that you are looking to trade, you sometimes find that the only way to get access to that sort of payoff is, is through derivatives. And that's one of the exciting things about building a derivatives exchange like Vega, where anyone can create the markets. That means people are going to create all kinds of interesting markets on things we've never thought of. And that's actually one of the most exciting things about Vega. Definitely. And again, like leading into my next question, Barney, is you guys have a big emphasis, again, going back to the website, going through, looking through the pages, looking through the documentation, permissionless, decentralized, and you being based in the UK, crypto is universal after all, but there has been since everything that happened last year, and I hate saying these names all the time, like FTX, Luna, 3AC, and so it's been I'm like, okay, we need to know who your traders are, who are these people, KYC, etc. 
how does that play with what you guys are doing with Vega, with the decentralized ethos? So I think, uh, yeah, we're based in Gibraltar, not London, actually. So the, the team's out there and the, the sort of company. But I think one of the problems with centralization is in crypto, why bother? And what I mean is like in TradFi, you have centralization, but you have very strong regulation. So like, I don't have to know what's going on inside the London Stock Exchange to trust it because there's a lot of insurance, but there's also a lot of regulation. And so I am relying on those things to say, I can buy stocks on the London Stock Exchange and it's going to work out the way I expected. And if it doesn't, I have recourse. Or you have the crypto model with a blockchain where you go, I can read the code, I can see the rules, everyone can audit that, we can see what's going on. And so I can see that this is going to happen and this is going to work this way. And so I can decide that I'm willing to trade because I can verify that what I'm doing is going to happen. Or you have the FTX model, which is like they're going somewhere where there is like no significant regulation on what they do and where they think they can get away with doing literally anything. And for a while they did. So there's no regulatory oversight. There's no insurers or audits who are giving you any comfort that actually you know what's going on in there. And you can't look at the code and see what anyone's doing. So in the best case, maybe there are underhand incentives going on and you could be ripped off or there are traders front running you or all kinds of things you don't know, or that they're spending your money on political donations, but they don't lose it all. And so therefore they give it back when you need it. So in the best case, like you don't know what's going on in there, but it's but at least you might get your money back. Maybe it's an unfair market, but whatever. And in the worst case, they're doing all of that and also apparently running an incompetent hedge fund on the side. And so the outcome is that everyone loses all their money. That doesn't seem great. Like, I think I would rather trade on a fully regulated centralized crypto exchange in my local country. And so to that extent, I don't see the road forward for things like FTX. You either want to be fully regulated and centralized or decentralized. The problem with becoming fully regulated and centralized is you become part of the traditional financial system. You start moving as slowly as the traditional financial system. You start being as gatekeepers as the traditional system. You start giving the access and the rewards and the rent seeking to the same players. Or maybe it's not the same players. Maybe it's new. Maybe Coinbase is the next Goldman Sachs. Because maybe, so maybe Coinbase is the one who makes the money off of the little guy instead of Goldman. Do, do I really care if it's Co Coinbase or Goldman? I'm in the sort of crypto world, but it doesn't fill me with any particular joy to meet the old master, same as the new master. That doesn't seem to help. So it's, to me, it's if you want to do this stuff, what you actually want to do is build the infrastructure layer. You want to build the infrastructure layers to make this stuff happen in a decentralized way. And of course, you will have many trade-offs where you don't do that entirely. Like you might have, just like people have custodians where actually someone else has some amount of control over their Bitcoin. Hopefully it's like multi-party computation. Hopefully it's not quite as bad as banking, but ultimately with those MPC custodians, they all have rules that say, if the regulator comes and if the government comes and tells us to give you your money, then we will. You'd think that those MPC things are protected from the government doing that? No, of course they're not. They're protected from one of those individual companies going rogue, but they're not protected from, say, the government. So you'd make a trade-off there, but actually I would rather someone else manage my keys for me and my security, and I'll make that trade-off. So I think that's going to happen, but you're still in a sort of decentralized system where ultimately the protocols are open. Anyone can come in and do that. A wallet on Fireblocks is the same as a wallet on my ledger. is the same as a wallet on your smartphone. Ultimately, if we're not building that infrastructure when we're building stuff in crypto, we're just trying to make a new version of the centralized financial system where we get rich instead of someone else. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. <laughs> but that's not really why I'm here. That's why we're going big on the decentralization, big on the infrastructure piece. We think it's longer lasting. Like ultimately, you, if you're not trying to do a very regulated thing, you're probably going to get forced to either do what we're doing or become very regulated. I can't speak for the exact reasons why DOADX moved to a much more decentralized V4, which is built of a very similar design to Vega. But one of those reasons might be the number of centralization points and control points they had might have been untenable for them to say they were a decentralized exchange and to avoid regulation. So I don't know for sure, but yeah, that, that seems likely based on the direction of travel. I really think we're going to be centralized and regulated. We're going to build a centralized thing. We're going to obey the rules. We're going to be a good actor within that, or we're going to build decentralized infrastructure. We're not the ones running the exchange, so we don't have to do the same things. We're writing code and the people using, people providing liquidity, creating markets, using it are the ones who are likely to be regulated. And of course, the extra fun bit that sits on top of all of that is every single government in the world is trying to work out what rules they'd like to make or change relating to DeFi and everything else. And so that's just the state of play right now, and it could change. Nice. We'll see. Yes. DOIDX was a 
Very appropriate comments. Bunny, I mean, chatting to you, like you're a very, of course, extremely intelligent person. With the way you've set up Vega, having it being permissionless market strike, but th does that still leave you room to create some of your own interesting products built on top of Vega or options or other things, right? Or is this moving forward only going to be community driven? Look, ultimately, we can't really do things where we like exercise control over it. So we can't say there's going to be this market tomorrow. We would have to go through the same rules as everyone else. We've got to say, we're going to propose this market. When it comes to creating actual markets, I think we probably won't do that because I think blurs the line between us as developers and stewards of the protocol and blurs it both from a regulatory point of view, but it also blurs it from a community point of view of people saying, hang on, these guys have an unfair advantage. They made the system and now they're creating markets and getting the rewards. We don't really want to be in that boat. We'd rather just make the system and help others to do those things. The things we might do when the sort of V2 of Vega comes around and you can code up your own products like options, for instance, we'll probably code up some of those products and release them as open source products so that people can use them to create their own markets. We will keep building more building blocks. We'll keep building more code that people can use to do stuff, but we probably will never really go in and say, hey, we're going to launch this particular market or be market makers or anything like that. That's not really what we're interested in doing. We don't really think it's fair to the rest of the community. I'd rather, if it was going to be something like that, I'd rather like work with a bunch of VCs and set up like an ecosystem fund or something and actually have that fund, seed fund the liquidity and the creation of some new markets or something, you know, but by community members. So I'd rather do something like that where we actually gave money to community members who were going to create markets that we thought were interesting or innovative in some way. I don't know how we would make that work, but I would rather do something like that than us come and actually launch markets directly. Thank you for that clarification. I'm listening to this podcast and watching the video as well. And it's like, you've said so many interesting things and the cogs are turning in my brain. And just, I had to ask because I'm like, oh, these things that you've said, I'm like, oh, I'd love to be able to trade this derivative or do that, etc. But you've said a lot, right? And I try to keep these podcasts shorter as it's 2023 and people's attention spans are unfortunately less and less, right? We've talked so much about Vega. I want to step back a bit and look at crypto, look at the ecosystem, look at blockchain tech, look at like all the work you've put in. How do you feel about the state of the industry at the moment? You said the company is based in Gibraltar, you're in the UK, everything that's going on in the US and the rest of the world. What's your feeling about the direction the industry is taking? Probably two halves to that. On the one hand, let's start with the negative first. There's some aspect that's a little bit depressing, which is the huge sort of takeover of large swathes of crypto, and especially the loud vocal bits on things like Twitter, by this sort of combination of people who want to make a quick buck by creating projects that are not very sincere and not very good, and people who want to make a quick buck by buying tokens that are going to go up. And those things feed off each other. It's like someone... Someone makes some nonsense with the intent of pumping it. Some other people like want to find things. There's this kind of whole thing going on and it's pretty not great. And it's a little depressing to watch. And it means that every time you get the sort of the crypto criticizers or anti-crypto commentators on Hacker News or people like Molly White or Gary Gensler or whoever, you can go, yeah, they've got a point. There's a whole, there's so much of that stuff that you look at it and go, this is a bit of a shame because none of us who have been doing research and building things and doing things in a very earnest way in trying to make you know good and useful things really have a part in that and are really trying to make that happen it's just a consequence of what happens when you give people open tech it's a bit like sms scams like you give people sms some of them are going to use them to try and scam old ladies out of their money and it's a shame but that is the, the consequence of openness is that there's freedom to do things and some of those people will use that to do bad stuff so that's the kind of depressing part because i think that took over far more than it should have done in some areas of crypto and some of the narrative. And part of that's probably because some of the big leaps forward in terms of L2s or new types of chain or things like Vega have taken a long time to build. So we've had a lull in the real innovation as the people have been building. So that part I'm, is a bit of a shame. And I hope we can collectively work together to eject it from crypto and its spaces. And then I think the other part is actually really positive, which is to say, Luna was painful, but people had to learn that you can't inflate your way out of a death spiral. Like every dictator has learned, if you just keep issuing currency, it'll devalue faster than you issue it. So you just get hyperinflation, it goes wrong. Like I think people had to see some of that happen to learn some of these like failure modes and in ingrain them in the psyche. And it took a little bit long and people lost more money than would have been ideal. But I think crypto is doomed to learn all of the lessons of like the past thousand years of finance, but rapidly. And we're doing that. We're going through all of these lessons and learning them. But I think Ultimately, things like that had to happen. And things like FTX just remind you, if it's not regulated and no one is saying it's any good and you can't see inside it, 
then probably not a good idea to assume it's any good and it's going to look after your money. And I think those things are quite positive because although they've happened, they've created more awareness and a good environment. And now what we're starting to see is more perpetual protocols, protocols like Vega. We're starting to see green shoots of new things. We've All the heat's been taken off because people are no longer buying Bitcoin, expecting it to quadruple and we're back to building. So I think what I'm optimistic about is the number of builders who've been making incredible stuff and how much work is being done on things like the UX of crypto in general and wallets. I still don't like MetaMask. I still don't understand why it's the most popular one. It still confuses me, but yeah, we're getting slowly better with things like UX. I think that the general direction of travel there is that things are improving and they're improving in a lot of different ways that are not necessarily visible. And over the next six to 18 months, I think what we're going to start seeing is lots of these next generation things, including Vega, connect together and become part of like the next wave that takes crypto closer to mainstream adoption and real world utility. So yeah, I'm overall positive, but there's certainly a bunch of things that are not ideal as well. True. And a great summary of pretty much everything in the last like year or so. Barney, thank you so much for your time. As usual on this podcast, we like to end off the show giving you an opportunity to say anything that you want to say about Vega or yourself or anything in general, right? The floor is yours. There are two things I wanted to mention. So I'll throw these out there very quickly is that if you guys haven't checked out Vega's GitHub roadmap, it is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Uh, you guys know I'm a big fan of organization and you can see what's being worked on. It's very transparent, very cool. It should give you inspiration about crypto, not just Vega, but also about crypto yourself. The other thing as well is there's some documentation about MEV, Money Extracted Value, and Wendy. That's also a cool solution that you guys have going on. But anyway, I just want to touch on those very quickly. You can talk about any of those or anything else. The floor is yours. Take as much time as you want. Yeah, for sure. Actually, those are two great things to touch on. Wendy and MEV, something we have designed and we've got the research papers out. But we're building it into Vega in probably the next year or so. It basically gives a much more robust sort of anti-MEV solution. And I think anti-MEV is probably better than accepting MEV and doing the flashbots thing. Personally, I don't think that's a great solution. So yeah, Wendy, check it out on the research side and it'll be coming to the actual protocol in the core in probably the next year. And then on the roadmap side, I'm really glad to hear you that you like the GitHub stuff. We're trying really hard to like condense down all of the stuff happening across our God knows how many at this point repositories of code and everything we're doing in a way that makes it understandable, but doesn't dumb it down too much. And to touch on the roadmap, I think really exciting stuff coming. First thing that will be look out for really soon is the alpha release of our browser wallet. So nice. you will soon be able to add a Vega wallet to your browser mm -hmm. rather than having to download an application. So it should be much easier to get started and onboarded and a nicer experience for doing transactions. If you're interested in Vega or using Vega, I recommend looking out for that and installing the alpha when it becomes available. We are also adding perps to the protocol probably sometime around September, October. So you will start to see a release go to mainnet at that point where people will start creating perps markets. Functionally for most traders, not that much different to futures, to be honest. There's the fact that they last forever so you can keep the position open longer without having to roll it. And it's a little bit easier for market makers for that reason as well. But yeah, people like perps in crypto will be adding those new features as well. So stop loss orders and take profit orders and margin isolation will be coming. And another cool thing is the spot market. Spot trading will be available plus also Ethereum Oracle Bridge, which is really cool, will be our Ethereum Bridge will be extended to support Oracles. So effectively, any Ethereum smart contract can become an Oracle for a Vega market. So if you are thinking of creating a market, you no longer have to build like an Oracle on Vega or use the sort of Vega transaction side. You only need to do that for the market creation itself. You can actually use existing Oracles on Ethereum and Chainlink or whatever, reference them in your Vega market proposal by contract address and with the ABI, and then you can literally create a market on anything that you can get data from on Ethereum. So that's going to be super exciting. So I think it just opens up a world of extra markets people can have fun creating. That is super exciting. And you've talked about a lot of exciting things today. Barney, quick question before we talk about social media. But like when I get up podcasts, I always like to follow guests and see if they're on other media in the future. Are you going to be doing like videos at a somewhat regular pace? basis in the future yeah certainly it feels like i'm on a podcast like once or twice a week i think at the moment probably nice. so there's been quite a lot some small ones big ones whatever we can find really just want to tell people about what we're doing and answer questions and go and meet the community and it's difficult to meet people in person over the internet one way that we can get a bit closer to that is doing a few of these so yeah quite quite a few of those also look out for things there's going to be events at some of the conferences this year where we will have a presence and maybe even be running some small events, things nice. like Token 2049, Dev Connect in Istanbul and others. So 
look out for us in person at those. We're also looking to do some community meetups in cities where we have either community members or team members who are living and working there, more low-key pizza and beer type things. So again, we'll probably publish those as and when we do them. So we'll, we'll be at those as well. But yeah, certainly going to keep doing these sort of videos and podcasts whenever people will have me really. Nice. So perhaps the best place to keep track of that would be Twitter or Telegram. Yeah, Twitter is probably the main place. We tend to post everything there. And if you're if you're more more engaged and more bought in, then obviously Discord. Discord can be a lot because there's all the chat as well. But if you really want to see everything, announcements, chat, get the latest, ask us questions, then Discord is the one. Cool. Okay, I will make sure. So as usual with this podcast, all those links will be down there. Bunny, are there any personal socials you feel comfortable letting people follow you on? Um, yeah, my, my personal Twitter is at Barnaby, B-A-R-N-A-B-E-E. So you can find me there. And that's probably the main one that I use. I am on Blue Sky with the same name at bsky.social, but I haven't decided how much I'm posting. I haven't decided how much I'm posting anywhere, really. But, you know, we'll see where that goes. But, sure. yeah, those are the two two main places. Cool. I will include that as well. Thank you very much for your time. Barney, it is much appreciated. And I hope everyone enjoyed the podcast. I did for sure. As usual, right, make sure you follow Vega Protocol, make sure you follow Barney. Let me know what you thought about today's episode, and then we can hopefully get Barney on at the end of the year, talk about perps, talk about all the other exciting stuff that is coming, see the progress on Wendy and MEV Tech, because as Barney mentioned about flashbots, some people are not a fan of them. I'm not gonna mention names. We've talked about that before on the show. Anyway, thank you again, Barney, and we will catch up later. Awesome, thanks for having me, Karen. Let's speak soon.